the conversation we have today with Jean Litka. And I hope so when you want to stay online, you are taped. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a warm welcome here uh, at the Health and Years Tea Club Book Club. Um, and we're super happy to have you here today. Maybe first um, two words about the Tea Club. So the Tea Club is a grassroots network within Siemens Health and Years. And it's all about business transformation and um, how to bring people together who want to drive transformation, who want to change, who rather embrace um, new concepts, new ways of thinking than fighting against it. And um, the book club I found together with Bettina, who will introduce herself in a minute. And I'm Silke Sassano. I'm the principal key expert for design thinking here in Siemens Health and Years and do a lot of um, design thinking work over the years and decades. And um, the book club we founded because Bettina and myself, we love reading books. And we thought it might be a good idea to found a book club and um, invite the authors for discussions. And with this, I hand it to you, Bettina. Oh, thanks so much, Silke. So my name is Bettina Maisch. I'm a professor for entrepreneurship at the Munich University of Applied Science and at the Straschek Center for Entrepreneurship and a former Siemens colleague. So Silke and myself, we are partners in crime and we are both design thinkers. And this is why I'm really, really happy to welcome uh, Professor John Litka. Um, I met her years and years ago um, at the Academy of Management in Boston, which will take place there this year again, I heard. And um, I was aware of Jean Litka and her work already before and I was so eager to get to know her and I'm a huge fan of uh, publications uh, this is not the first book um, on design thinking and design work and we are very glad to have you here today Jean and um, is do do we have uh, some further questions or things we have to clarify Silke or can we you can just start. rather explain maybe quickly the concept for of today, Bettina, if you want yes. to do this. Yes, please. Would you like or should I? So Jean will introduce, uh, so it, uh, it's about the book Experiencing Design. She wrote together with Karen Holt and Jessica Eldridge. And you do not have to read, uh, have read the book already. Of course, we would be happy if you already have done that. Um, but Jean will give an introduction what the book is all about. And uh, we hope you will buy it afterwards, later. And um, you are able to ask the author questions. And we would like to ask you to write them, but we will call you up and uh, that we have a very vivid conversation with the author. And this is the special element of the book club that we are inviting the authors of the books we would love to discuss and know more about also the intention of the author, why to write, what would be the next steps. And um, so have I forgot every, anything, Silke? No, or, I think no? so. Everybody, audience, um, be ready for questions. And also we ask also Jean Litka to ask questions to us because this is a, let's say, conversations always goes in both ways. And yeah, let's get started. We hand it over to you. <laughs> Well, thank you. It's, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm especially excited to have a chance to have a conversation with uh, with such an experienced and expert group. Um, uh, this this work is really the culmination of about 15 years of work that I've been doing with other colleagues at the University of Virginia on design thinking. Um, and of course, I started, I said, it's always intimidating to me to talk to real designers because of course I'm a business person, um, not only a business person, my undergraduate is actually in accounting. So I like to think of myself as, as far from a creative thinker as you will ever find. Um, but at the university, my specialty has always been business strategy. And so I wandered into design quite by happenstance, um, looking for ways to help managers who are interested in growing their business. And of course, in the world of strategy, we have many frameworks, many toolkits, but almost all of them are around helping people decide among alternatives, right? They're essentially um, 
how to test and select, this whole idea of how to create new ideas and concepts and services, I always felt that I was at a real disadvantage as an educator because we had really very little tools or processes that could help managers do this. Um, so I began reading actually in the architecture field because I always felt that the design of space that architects do had a great many um, really resonated with me around what we do when we create strategy as managers, right? We design a space. It's not a physical space the way architects do, um, but we surround people with systems and values and processes and all kinds of things with this idea of creating a space that evokes certain types of behaviors. So for me, it was very interesting to think about what it meant to create a space that evoked creative behaviors, behaviors related to identifying possibilities for organic growth rather than the more traditional, uh, the traditional ways of thinking. So of course I wandered into design thinking uh, and, and what I discovered relatively quickly as I tried to teach it to my own MBA students at the university was that the materials largely had been written by designers for other designers, right? Or else they were what I would call the great works, you know, the great man books, the, the, the people like Tim Brown writing about his experiences, but usually not at a level of detail that really provided a kind of a how-to for managers interested um, in learning more about this amazing way of solving problems, uh, but who didn't have the opportunity to actually have formal training in design. So really for the next 10 years, I would say, <clears throat> I have been writing and thinking about how to help non-designers use some of these very powerful tools out of the design thinking repertoire. So I've uh, I've taught, I think my Coursera course now has has had a cumulative enrollment of almost 500,000 people. It's incredible these days and lots of MBAs and lots of executives face to face. What we learned over time, I think, um, was that it was possible to teach this very superficially. You know, we all know the one day hackathons where where people put people in a room with lots of post-it notes and at the end of a day, send them back to their work thinking that they had uh, learned design thinking. And, and in some ways we all know that's worse than not pretending to teach it at all because people have a very superficial knowledge. So we set out to try and understand what it was to create a sufficient depth of knowledge in this area. So that's really the origin of this book. It's really why we we pursued this in the first place um, and tried to understand what it meant as it as a learner to truly experience design. And, and that really is a central premise of our book. So, for instance. We believe that most of us think of design thinking as a set of activities that we do. Right? We gather data, we identify insights, establish design criteria, or ask how might we questions. We generate ideas, prototype, and test. Right? But when we looked at the journey of our learners over the past 10 years, and, and again, as academics, we have a lot of data on that. We use various kinds of instruments uh, with the students to measure capabilities. We uh, students journaled throughout their learning experience. We really decided that it was much more complex than that because the doing was just the superficial surface level. What mattered was that learners were having a set of experiences and those experiences were fundamentally changing not only their skills, but their mindsets and in fact, who they were. And so this is this book is really about unpacking that innovator's journey, starting with the doing, which is familiar to all of us, and then really exploring what are the kinds of experiences that we have to provide learners with at each stage of the design process in order to really trigger the development of a meaningful level of design thinking capabilities. Now, we know we're 
we're not even going to try to pretend that we're achieving the equivalent of people who are actually trained in design and in design school. But again, our focus here has been on helping non-designers learn enough of the tools and perspectives and techniques of design thinking so that they can bring this incredibly rich new way of thinking and behaving to them, to their own world, regardless of where they are in the organization. Because for me, one of the, the magical properties of design thinking is everyone at every level in every aspect of their life can use these tools to make life better, both for themselves and for others. So it's really this idea of a doing, experiencing, and becoming cycle that we focus on in the book. Doing obvious activities that would be familiar to all of us, but then exploring how are we as, as innovators on this journey experiencing something, and then finally, who are we becoming as a result of that experience? So again, uh, my guess is to all of you who are experienced in this world, it's kind of intuitively obvious, this journey, and, and you've all experienced it, you've watched others experience it. Our goal in this book was to articulate it in a way that was meaningful to people, regardless of their background, coming from all walks of life, and to help them understand from a leader's viewpoint, how we could deepen the experiences our people were having at each level in order to help them become, in this world, more empathetic and curious, more confident and inspired that they can themselves create, more collaborative and focused on their users. And I think a particularly important aspect, more comfortable with co-creation and difference. Um, and then able to visualize and bring things to life and to learn in action. And to me, these skills have become not just nice design thinking skills to have, but really the essence of what it takes to prosper and survive in this uncertain, complex, diverse world we live in. So just as an overview, I think immersion is probably the most familiar stage. We all know that when we go out and we do good ethnographic data gathering, we change who we are as people. We step into the world of those we're trying to serve, and we look at it from the perspective of their deep needs, rather than imposing our own views about what they should need. Um, and of course, this is nowhere more prevalent than healthcare. Right. A world that has historically been where experts with superior knowledge uh, of of the science of healthcare, right, have assumed uh, a lot of things about the people they were trying to serve. And we've all seen lots of stories of how building strategies around this false set of assumptions has led to continued lack of adoption of the kind of behaviors that everyone knows are important to helping them be healthier people leading more productive lives. That immersion in the experiences of others and the shifts in mindset it, it, it creates actually set the foundation for the entire rest of the journey, right? So out of that immersion and the complexity and kind of overwhelmingness of the qualitative rich data we're dealing with, we learn to find patterns and make sense, right? And in particular, in design thinking, we're normally doing this in teams. So we begin this process of, as a collective, making sense of this data we've gotten from the people that we've immersed ourselves in the experiences of. And out of that joint collective sense making comes the beginnings of alignment, right? <clears throat> Certainly as a strategist, I know that the reason most business strategies fail is not necessarily because they were a bad idea, but th that people who must change their behaviors to make them real are not aligned and committed to them. Right. And for me, this is, again, one of the great powers of design thinking that we don't talk often enough. It creates a different kind of conversation, a conversation that invites people to leave their parochial differences aside and instead to align themselves around meeting a defined set of needs of others. 
right? Incredibly powerful. But that alignment does not happen without first the immersion that shifted our willingness to open up to others. And then secondly, the sense making that allowed us to gain confidence that we saw a set of underlying needs. All of these three aspects of the journey set the stage for me, uh, what is the most intriguing part of this whole journey? And that is this phenomena of emergence, right? So often at this stage, we talk about ideation. We talk about generating ideas. We talk about brainstorming. But these are all just superficial tactics in some ways that create the conditions for emergence. Right? And we know that for me, the, you know, the holy grail of design thinking is that a group of people come together immersed in the needs of another and they see together possibilities that none could see alone. Right. And it is that alignment and sense making and immersion that set the conditions that allow emergence to occur real time. Right. So as I think of my traditional world of strategy, nothing could be further than this as a phenomena for creating new ideas. Right. In strategy, we pretend that we can identify a problem as though there weren't multi definitions across diverse stakeholder groups. Right? Then we lay out our options as though we could see the truly interesting and creative options at the start of the process. And then we choose among them to pick the best one based on some criteria that assumes good data that actually is predictive, right? We know that none of those conditions really exist in the real world today. Right. The options that really matter emerge only in the conversation. We can't see them in advance. Right. We can't agree on the definition of the problem often in advance. We can never know whether our solution is optimal. We can only try it and see what works. Right. So for me, emergence captures where the magic of design thinking comes together and where all of our traditional thinking around the creation of new products and services and strategies is based on a set of utterly fallacious assumptions. Now, having done all that, we then move into, I think, what remains always the most difficult part of design thinking for those of us who haven't been trained as designers, which is visualization, right? Again, prototyping, we create a little storyboard, right? That's that's just the superficial level. What's happening here is we are figuring out how to take an idea that exists in the head of a small group of people and make it vividly real to those we have to seek feedback from. And then finally, if we succeed in that, our odds of being able to learn in action are greatly, are greatly increased. Right? So we can unpack each of these. I'll just quickly, in the interest of time, um, make the point that underlying each of these experiences is, is, is the development of a new set of behaviors. Tying these experiences to identifiable behaviors has been very important to us as researchers. Um, I spent several years away from the world of academia as the chief learning officer for United Technologies. It had a huge impression on me because it made me realize how very challenging it was to take these high level and abstract capabilities and ideas and actually use them to do skill development at an individual level within organizations. Right. In the strategy area, we talk about strategic capabilities all of the time as those strategic capabilities didn't fundamentally rely on a group of individuals learning new things. And that connection between the strategy piece and individuals learning new things, in my view, can only happen in learning systems that are able to identify a specific set of behaviors that we're trying to help people get comfortable and good at. So for us, the next step was to take each of these phases and try and, and extract from them a small set of identifiable behaviors. And again, these are completely obvious to anyone who knows these. There's no there's no rocket science, as we would say, in any of these. They're they're the obvious things we have to get good at. 
to get good at aligning with other people, obviously we have to get good at letting go of our own perspective and being open to that of others. To get good at finding deeper needs, we have to learn to push beyond the obvious, right? We need to know how to develop emotional engagement with each other. Um, one of my favorites is resisting the urge to prematurely compromise, which I think is one of the great enemies of creative thinking in organizations today. So drilling down to a set of examples, um, uh, and we could we could trade, you know, we could follow them through, for instance, in immersion. I won't spend a lot of time here, but there's a very obvious mindset shift from egocentric to empathetic, right? From detached to engaged, from impatient to solve problems, to willingness to invest in really understanding the current situation. All of these these different mindset shifts have related to them a new set of behaviors, right? People need to learn to listen to understand rather than test their own ideas, right? They need a self-awareness of their own biases and blinders. These are the kinds of specific behaviors that signal to us someone is doing immersion well, right? They are having a deep experience of it. Similarly, learning in action. What I love about design thinking is it is a very complex set of skills, right? If we look at the skills that have to do with fully experiencing immersion, they are about emotional engagement. They are about the other, uh, about sensitivity to the needs of others, right? Then we move to learning and action, which is essentially about experimentation. It is about detachment, not personal attachment, right? We're, we're explicitly detaching. We're setting our own emotions beside, and instead of thinking like a creator, we're trying to think like a scientist, or in some ways a venture capitalist is that. Um, and instead of having a deep emotional attachment, we're trying to literally detach from our own ideas and treat them as hypotheses and test them. So again, the set of behaviors we need to learn to be good at that, completely different than the set we had in version. Here, we're talking about designing experiments. We're talking about accepting imperfect data, detaching ego, being able to work with disconfirming data, listening non-defensively to critique. All of these, a very important set of behaviors, but completely different from ones that we've had to practice earlier in the process. So that's really where our book ends. Uh, the book ends with this notion of here's a set of behaviors. We need to begin to assess and develop them as people move through the design thinking process. In the 18 months or so since the book has been out, we've been trying to really address um, at an organizational level how, how these changes in skill set and mindset show up and how we can use them to build learning systems around people that help them develop a deep enough expertise in design thinking that we can begin to tap into the incredible uh, possibilities it represents. Oh, but there's my timer telling me I've talked long enough. So uh, let me just sh to talk a little bit about how we're doing this. Uh, we created a skills assessment document. We've been working with a, a London-based design group called Treehouse Innovation on this. Um, fabulous people doing really interesting things. They've been amazing partners. Together, we've taken the work in experiencing design, and we've translated it into both a self-assessment and a peer assessment. Right? And then uh, we've had a chance to ask, I think we're well over a 1,000 people now, to take that assessment to see if we can extract these behaviors into a common set of skills so that we can develop them outside of the learning design thinking process. So the book in many ways was about following a design thinking process from immersion and data gathering right through to learning and action and experimentation. Right? We wanted to decouple the ability to learn these capabilities from the design process, however, so we could more broadly help people develop innovation capabilities. So um, we've done a lot of reports out of this assessment and all to help people begin the development process. But what has really emerged that has been important for uh, from an academic viewpoint 
is our factor analysis research basically has pointed to five key capabilities. Right? So you'll see here we're rolling the cumulative number of 44 behaviors we identified on the innovator's journey from immersion to learning and action through the process and through factor analysis. We are allowing them to cluster in actual capabilities that we can develop and the clusters result in five capabilities that again I think will be uh, will be obvious to all of you. The first is opportunity seeking, right? We could call those divergent skills. We could call them creative thinking skills, but in fact, they're the bucket of skills that we would almost identify first with design thinking, right? And they have to do with the set of behaviors around challenging conventional wisdom, digging deeper, redefining the problem in, in more valuable ways, exploring non-traditional solutions, exploiting surprise, right? A very fundamental set of behaviors that also sit on a very particular mindset, I would say, um, and in some ways almost a personality indicator around a tolerance for ambiguity and messiness, the ability to resist closure and premature compromise, the discipline to continue iteration and search, a very critical bundle in the design thinking world that we can develop as its own kind of universe. The other four skills are quite different than this though. The other obvious one I'd say is relationship skills. We all know that, for instance, important to, important to doing front end good ethnographic work is the ability to listen heedfully and with respect. Um, to know how to inquire rather than advocate, right? All of these kinds of behaviors. But these are equally important in the alignment phase as we try and work together as a team and as we try and work across diverse stakeholder groups. So we have to be good at dealing with difference and seeing difference as an opportunity rather than a threat. Right? So all of these behaviors around relationship skills are their own separate bundle. OK, having relationship skills without the opportunity seeking skills will not get you creative ideas but having only opportunity seeking skills will likely not get you alignment and real outcomes in the world where other people have to work with you in order to accomplish things. The third bucket is for me one of the most interesting. It's, it's this whole issue of reflection skills, and I'm not sure we're very good at teaching these, right? This is where people are developing awareness not only of themselves and being able to step out of how they see the world, but also are developing the ability to articulate their own perspectives and world views to others in ways that invite them to explore our reasoning with us. Um, and so this set of reflection skills where we both learn how to take other perspectives and then together make new perspectives, I think is rich with possibilities and is almost this skill is almost hidden behind success in every single aspect of the design thinking process, this ability to reflect. We then have the presencing skills. Again, this is where people learn to make a future feel real to people. Um, in some ways, it could be as simple as teaching people storyboarding, um, but those of us who've tried to teach storyboarding know it's much more complex than that, right? This is one where I think design school produces an innate set of capabilities that people often can't even articulate that make them very good at this. And it's also the area where traditional managers are most uncomfortable and have the least exposure, right? I can't draw. We've all heard that a thousand times as though the essence of prototyping was actually being able to draw, which we know it's not, right? Tremendous opportunity, I think, in helping people to enhance their presencing skills. And then finally, oops, I think we lost one, scientific reasoning. This is the one um, I was just uh, uh, telling your 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 book team is the one that we've been working on most recently, and we have a, a new field project book coming out because I feel as though scientific reasoning skills should be taught and are not. Right? How do we teach these? I tell my students go off and design and experiment, as though most people have any idea how to design and experiment. 
right? And this middle ground between, you know, I design things that aren't really experiments at all, they're launches, right? And I'm conducting sophisticated trials of the kind that you would do in the healthcare world. That middle ground where people are doing rigorous testing that's fast and cheap and learning focused, right? Um, we really feel that that is a huge opportunity set. If I had to pick one skill that all managers were going to need to survive in this world of uncertainty and change we live in today, it is scientific reasoning skills. And instead, we teach people to mindlessly extrapolate data from Excel spreadsheets and attempt to use that to predict the future. And with the reality that it's impossible to predict the future accurately in a changing world. And we should, in many cases, stop trying and get very good at conducting small experiments. So that's kind of where we are. We've started to play with that a little into how you help people. If I want to build out my opportunity seeking skills, for instance, what's a quick and dirty way to begin to develop that, right? And, uh, and that's really where a lot of our focus is right now on trying in a hands-on way to help people in an efficient kind of way develop these new skills or refine the skills they've already got. Um, but that's where we are. So with that, we will now see if I can stop sharing. Always challenge for me. Let me close the slideshow. And see if we can get back. Ah, we're back. And, and I'm back with you and the slide shows off. Well, that's a minor technology miracle right there uh, in Microsoft. I was explaining we are a Zoom shop at the university. So I, I, they've managed to teach even us low tech folks how to operate reasonably well in Zoom. But uh, put me in Microsoft Teams and the odds of success go way down. So thank you for the guidance of your team to uh, to get me as far as I got today. Thank you very much, Jean. This is, uh, was a wonderful talk and it's super exciting. And I want to open up the floor for questions. Are there any by saying thank you? Already uh, we have Gerrit Wigger. Um, let's start with the audience here. Gerrit, Gerrit, would you like to phrase the question orally? We see it here in the chat. Yeah, well, first of all, uh, thank you very much uh, for this overview. Um, I, I must admit, I um, didn't read the entire book. It's very thick. Uh, <laughs> that's maybe one reason, but it, uh, the, the parts I uh, read are really uh, nice. And I especially like the summaries uh, where you try to summarize um, the, uh, the skill sets and uh, the activities that you should take. Um, though, uh, my question goes to um, yeah, the very beginning where you say that you have evidence and proof that design thinking works. And I scrolled through the entire book and then didn't find any. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk to that. Where's the proof? Uh, well, that is a different set of uh, uh, research projects that we've been working on over time, Garrett. And I think uh, there's a little bit of a report on it in like chapter two of the book, a, pa a couple of pages maybe, but not very much. Uh, uh, there's like a 60 page working paper on the ROI study. What we essentially did there was uh, for a lot of the 10 years of research, we've been tracking successful design thinking projects in organizations. So several of my earlier books are just case stories. Uh, one is in the non in the in the social sector, and it features stories from um, from you know different governments. Uh, some work in New Zealand and Australia. Some work in the U.S., for instance, um, at Health and Human Services. Uh, different nonprofit organizations, United Cerebral Palsy, things like that. The other ones on business organizations like IBM, SAP. So. Uh, we have this qualitative database then probably at this point of 50 or so cases uh, that we've published the research academically. And essentially, we've gone through to look at uh, what are the reported outcomes of design thinking in these projects. Usually, 
We've got pretty good triangulation, so we're not just interviewing one person at the organization who's extolling what a great job they did in their last design thinking project, right? Um, we've we've tried to make it more rigorous by triangulating the data. So each case has probably three to five people reporting on it. Uh, some of the outcomes are quantifiable, right? Um, I, there's a whole separate presentation on the challenges of measuring the return on investment of design thinking because so much of the deep impact is hard to measure. It's in changes to the conversation, changes in the mindset of people. And these things don't show up in measurable outcomes like revenue and reduced costs and things like that till years later. And then they show up with so many intervening variables that you can't rigorously as an academic claim uh, a causal relationship. But what we've done is over a great number of case studies, track these reported observations. And then we've queried fairly large groups of people doing design thinking about what they observe as the outcome. So out of all this research, we created a separate assessment document, which is an outcomes assessment. This is a behavioral individual level assessment. That is, a, that is an, an organizational outcomes assessment and administered that to, I think at this point, about 1,200 experienced people working in the design pieces of organizations. A lot of the work has been with Mural and working with Mural's clients, where you can get a, a big, a, a nice diversity of organizations, but all people fairly well versed in the kind of innovation work we're doing. Out of that, we identified a set of outcomes analytically and pretty rigorously. I mean, from an academic viewpoint, it's a, it's the factors are very high and the correlations are good. The inner rate of reliability is good, all of that. So we do have a set of outcomes we can point to. The most powerful ones are what I would call intermediate outcomes. They are not measuring how many new products and, and services did we produce. They are measuring, do teams work better together? Are people more willing to take risks? Is the organization becoming more customer centric, right? Are we better able to stop projects that are not producing results as well as start them, right? It's a whole set of intermediate outcomes that I think if we looked at them, almost any business manager you looked at would say, yes, if, if teams work better in that way, eventually I will reduce costs or increase sales. I will better serve my customers. So. You know, I'd happy I'd be happy to share the there's a there's an academic paper on that that's not particularly interesting to read, but there's a long working paper that has a lot more interesting qualitative data in it that I'd be happy to share to distribute. Um, and we can do another whole book, uh, even though that's not a book, so it might be cheating. Uh, we could do another whole discussion on outcomes because that's its own world and it's fascinating. But the relationship is that. When people were filling out those outcomes, we asked them to self-assess their degree of experience in design thinking. So people could call themselves a beginner. They could say they had some experience. They could say they had significant experience and they could say they were an expert. And when you cross factor analysis, the level of reported competency with the outcomes, what you find is a step function in which when you move people from beginner to intermediate skill levels, you dramatically improve the positive outcomes you get. But moving people from intermediate to expert produces a much smaller level of improvement in outcomes. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that. Part of it is we're trying to move managerial decision making, right? We're not measuring a lot of the skills that our expert designers have that business people will never have. But for the business related outcomes we're looking at, you have to get people to intermediate levels of skills and it doesn't matter then if you get them to expert. That's a powerful message for anyone who's a chief learning officer or trying to build capability development in organizations. What it says is you have to identify this intermediate level of capabilities. And if you succeed at developing to that level, you will reap most of the significant benefits we see associated with design thinking. So uh, apologies for that incredibly long and rambling uh, 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 
uh, of discussion. But that was in part why we wanted to do this new book, because we wanted to know what an intermediate level of capabilities might look like and how what it would take to develop those behaviors in people. Thank you. Then we have a thank you very much for the wonderful answer. Actually, I think it was very um, helpful for a lot of us and we would be happy if you could share this paper with us. We would Absolutely. distribute it. And Emin, you have a question here. Maybe you want to ask it by yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Silke. And thank you. Thank you for this great insightful session, Jen. Um, so my question was about uh, this, this skill set and whether it's possible for an individual to, to reflect, to implement all the whole scale of the skill set, or is it rather a teamwork? I was considering the opportunity seeking, relationship management, etc. For me, it's maybe a kind of blog and uh, the other more scientific approach uh, dealing with these nitty gritty details, et cetera. This might be in need another personality yes. and would it be better to have a, a to to reflect the whole skill set in a team environment? That was my question. Yes. No, I think you've put your finger on 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 what is a, one of the stark realizations I have had as an educator. I mean, is that relatively few people are naturally going to possess this portfolio of skills. They are almost diametrically opposite, right? And if you believe that there is a fairly strong personality in, you know, influence in what we do, um, you are unlikely to, 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 to be able to develop high levels of competencies across the board. Now, you can improve someone. Now, this is where we all say, you know, um, uh, taking tennis lessons may not turn you into Serena, but it could certainly improve your game, right? So we know that someone who's going to be stellar at something like relationship management, relationship skills, probably has a set of pretty hard embedded personality uh, traits that make them just naturally intuitively sensitive to other people, able to read other people. It's the whole emotional intelligence thing. But can I take an average person who's mostly scientifically minded and get them better at it? In part by just helping them to become aware that they're not very good at it and they should at least listen and respect to the team, the teammates who are good at it, right? I think that's the promise here, that in the end, High level performance across all five of these will almost undoubtedly have to come from teams. But they will have to be teams who are consciously composed to have this portfolio. So you can't put five scientifically minded people all on a team and expect that you're ever going to get really good at the, some of the other stuff, right? Um, uh, so you have to be, we have to be conscious in terms of our team composition, which means you have to be able to assess your own strengths and weaknesses and those of the people that you're putting on teams, right? And then you have to build an understanding of how important all of these factors are, where they have the most significant role to play. I mean, for instance, with scientifically minded people, you have to keep them from stomping all creativity and, and possibility thinking out during the early parts of the design thinking process, right? Um, and with the people who are superbly creative and opportunity seeking, you actually have to teach them that experiments are important, that we can't launch and scale things that have basically been tested with an N of 20, right? So, so everyone has their role to play, but you can only play that role if you understand why everyone's role is important and you respect the skills that other people bring. So in part, I think that's why this individual level work is so important. It will help, it, it needs to help each of us recognize our own strengths and weaknesses, commit to improving them to the extent that that's feasible, but also appreciate and leverage the very different perspectives and skill sets that other people are making so that as a team, we can be at our most effective. I mean, you know, we have decades of academic research that tell us that diversity of perspectives, backgrounds, and experiences is absolutely the key to more creative thinking on the part of teams. And we have lots of other research that tell us that because we are unable to navigate that difference, these diverse teams rarely achieve the capability that it rarely achieve the possibilities they're capable of, and actually often 
underperform less diverse teams, right? So this whole question of how we work with the richness of that diversity and see it as opportunity, not threat. I mean, you know, in the U.S. today, you know, diversity and inclusion initiatives are everything we talk about, right? To me, design thinking would make, teaching people design thinking would be a much better investment in diversity and inclusion and equity than most of the things we're teaching people as part of those, those programs. So I think that you're exactly right. This is ultimately about the team, but we need the individuals to get to high functioning teams. I would like to have uh, a question regarding the teams. In entrepreneurship, we have the minimal viable team with a hipster, hacker, and hustler. <laughs> What is your recommend recommendation regarding team composition? Well, I think if what we're looking for is a portfolio of these particular skills, then we need to begin to look at people who have these, these particular skills. I mean, there's some measurement already out there that is helpful. Like, for instance, one of the uh, leadership development instruments I have used with my design thinking students since day one is the DISC, right? And and the DISC, probably a lot of you are familiar with it. I think it's the second most used leadership instrument after the Myers-Briggs. It gives you these types, right? And those types are a wonderful proxy for people's level of comfort with ambiguity and how much they need and want to work with data in order to make decisions. So we have research from 10 years of MBA classes that says the more, the, the higher the number of different disc profiles on the team, the higher their grade, the, the group grade was in the class. Unmistakable, highly statistically significant. Groups that had all Ds were the dominance on them, almost always got lower grades than people who had a mix of dominance with influencers with more analytically data-oriented people, right? Now, they are also the teams that had the most difficulty working together and were most uncomfortable throughout the process, right? So we've been tracking this student data for years, and we know that the DISC, it's a crude instrument. It doesn't identify particular behaviors to help you develop them, but it helps you compose a better team because you can play with these proxies. This new self-assessment instrument we've tried to develop is trying to look specifically at these behaviors so that I can take, you know, okay, here's a person who's high on experimentation, low on relationship management, right? And when I put them in a team, I want to be sure there's somebody high in relationship management on that team, right? And I want to be sure that both of them understand why the other is important. So I think that's why we've pushed this, 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 uh, we've developed this new instrument. Um, it has a self-assessment component, and we know that self-assessment is often not as accurate as we would like it to be because we harbor illusions about what we're good at and not good at. But if you're going to actually develop people, you have to start with self-assessment because people develop where they think they have weaknesses. You know, we have a peer assessment version and the peer assessment version is very helpful for intact working teams who trust each other and will actually give honest feedback. And And as a chief learning officer, I really want the peer assessment data because that's what's going to tell me, for instance, in this part of the organization, what is the actual level of scientific reasoning skills, right? But I really think you need both of them. And you have to recognize that there's a pretty good margin of error for any assessment instrument, but at least this begins to give us something concrete to work with and to help people create their own personal development plans to work on areas where they are motivated to improve their skill set. I will have maybe an, an additional question to this in saying, um, you know, sometimes you have the luxury to put up a greenfield new project team where often they're already or we are pulled in into running project teams. So you have any Any good experiences, how to work is the team is already there, right? And you want to figure out probably where is the strength and the weakness of the team and what you're going to do with it. Any ideas or, or experiences with these scenarios? Well, I mean, this is one of the great gifts of design thinking, right? 
instead of lecturing people about skills and things like that, you kind of drag them unwittingly into a process. And after they've done a few interviews, they start to become more empathetic. I mean, you know, you take your hardened finance type MBAs and you send them out to, a, you know, to talk to some recently relocated refugees. They start to get it no matter where they start. Right. So part of Part of this is the magic of the doing of the design thinking process, because I think it holds a mirror up to people and they're not only learning in that whole ethnographic front end about the other people. They are learning about themselves and beginning to self reflect on who they are and why they think they're. And I could read you some of the journal entries from some of our students as they have their first few experiences where they realize, um, uh, you know, with a blinding insight, how narrow their view of the world and other people are and how much they've been imposing their views. I mean, that's all remarkable. And that's why just doing design thinking is so spectacular, I think. but. At the same time, asking people to assess themselves and where they believe they're good or not. So that self-assessment tool and then bringing them together to talk about each other's relative strengths and weaknesses. Right. That works for the same reason that we do all those team building things with the Myers-Briggs. Right. It gives us some emotional distance to talk about the way we find it hard to work together in a way that's safe. You know, and safety is so much of this work. You know, if you ask me the biggest impediment to more creative thinking in large organizations, overwhelmingly to me, it's psychological safety. Right. People feel extremely vulnerable stepping into the unknown. Why? Well, most of us have been raised that way. Right. And we can look at Carol Dweck's work on elementary age school children and see to the extent to which our mindsets have been molded to believe that we're only smart when we have the right answer, right? So there's a long history. And then we get into organizations and they punish failure and don't allow experimentation. And it all just compounds to make most people who haven't been trained in, in like design fearful of doing this stuff. Right. And I think it's often very hard for designers to understand how fearful traditional business people are when you ask them to do this stuff, because a combination of personality and training have left them with the level of comfort with ambiguity and messiness that nobody has in the rest of the organization. Right. And so I think as you start to work with the team you've got, which, again, is where most of us are, some combination of creating these kind of offside activities that let them in a safe way do some self-reflection and then allow the team to reflect on their own strengths and weaknesses and come up with a plan for how they can support each other in their strengths and begin to compensate for the weaknesses the team has, um, along with the actual doing of it, I think. It, so much of this work is about the doing of it. You can talk about design thinking and you can talk about all this stuff, empathy and all of this. But until people personally experience it, I would it like is kind of meaningless. Build on that. I really love two elements in the book. Uh, it's the learning in action you are elaborating on and the minimal viable competency. Yes. Um, you also talked about the challenge of unlearning. You, you mentioned the stepping in the unknown. You also said deep unlearning may surface confusion, anxiety or fear, while other negative feelings like blame, guilt or shame may be necessary for the process of unlearning. So yeah. especially, uh, so you also said unlearning is a serious business and requires actions as well as reflection. So now we're in a very professional context here many of our Siemens Helsingers and entrepreneurship colleagues they have years of years of working experience they had a serious course of study at a university and um, you mentioned also there is a kind of a, a risk to be perceived as the person who doesn't know how to deal with unlearning and being comfortable in not knowing in such a high pressure a uh, organizational environment. Yeah. Um, I would say there's a couple of things we can do to ease it. Um, you know, we, we're not going to undo 
basically the rest of a person's life that has led them to believe being smart means being right. Um, or organizations who in what 85 or 90 percent of their business operations have to be right. So it is about being right, right? It's about creating safe products that ship on time um, at the right price point and other levels. So we are we are trying to carve off little ecosystems in some ways where people find it safe to behave in ways that are antithetical to not only the way they were raised, but the way they're currently rewarded and what surrounds them, right? The first step in that is just acknowledgement, right? Because we pretend it doesn't exist. I mean, for instance, we know from all the research in entrepreneurship, we can find the most successful VC in Palo Alto, and their track record will probably not be better than two new businesses out of 10 they invest in actually survive and prosper. Two out of 10, meaning they are wrong eight out of 10. We go into a, a traditional large organization, and if I asked your managers, you have 10 projects, how many are you expected to succeed in? Uh, someone recently told me 11, right? Now, we're just ignoring reality there, right? It's like ignoring gravity, right, on the earth. I mean, the 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 physics of uncertainty that surround innovation and growth are such that you will be wrong more often than you are right, no matter how hard you work and how smart you are and how much homework and analysis you do, you know? But we don't acknowledge that. So one of the first steps I find is just helping people and their leaders to acknowledge this work is fundamentally different than the rest of the work we're doing in the organization. We have to set our expectations at a realistic level. Now, do we want people making dumb mistakes? Absolutely not, right? We want to teach people how to take intelligent risks, and we have to expect that we call them risks because they're sometimes going to fail. Right? But the only ultimate failure is the failure to learn. Right? An experiment is not a failure if we reject it. It's a failure if we don't learn enough to either confirm or disconfirm it. Right? And so there's a, a massive shift in acknowledgement, I think. And then once we've acknowledged that, I think we have to teach people a new set of tools. We do not teach people by and large in business how to manage risk. We teach them how to avoid risk. Right. When you when a risk avoidance is in your toolkit as your only way to think about risk, you do all kinds of stupid things that paradoxically actually increase your risk. I mean, and we can trace that through. Right. It, it's a, you you don't you don't if you don't do the kind of qualitative low end research on customers, chances are you're not identifying opportunities for differentiated products. So you're starting off badly. If you grow up in a tunnel of expertise, you don't have a broad repertoire, so you're not going to be able to see opportunity. And then if you use analysis, which is basically extracting data from the past in wildly creative ways to attempt to prove a new idea, you will only be slower and dig a deeper hole and end up investing in silver bullets that don't come out. So, so literally all of the things people think they do to manage risk, they are actually risk avoidance tools and they increase your risk. And so I think a lot of the design thinking tools are really risk management tools and particularly prototyping and experimentation and ethnographic research are all fundamentally tools that people need in order to be able to intelligently manage the investment to learning curve. And that's what we're really trying to do in a world of uncertainty, right? We're trying to ramp up investment in parallel with what we know, right? So we're trying to be fast and cheap early on, trying to test things. And then we're investing in more and more refined prototypes as we learn more and our risk of failure goes down, right? We very rarely teach that. I mean, and so so I, I think it's part acknowledgement and it, it's part just teaching people a new set of tools and practices and supporting people in experimentation. Uh, you know, experimentation is the polar opposite of traditional analytic approaches. It requires different mindsets, completely different skill sets, different organizational support and process. And we go and tell people to experiment and then we do not in any way support 
them to learn how to do that well and intelligently. In fact, we don't let them because half the time we don't let people talk to customers who aren't in marketing, right? Well, if you can't talk to customers, you obviously can't reduce the risk that you're building something they're not going to want, which is the number one risk we all face when we're trying to develop new products and services. So, so you know, it, there's a lot of moving parts in this system. You can start at the individual awareness and skill development. You can start talking about corporate culture and support systems and learning systems. But, you know, pick any place to start. Just acknowledge that we're asking people to do things that they have no real idea what we're talking about and that they are not equipped or supported to do in this world. Harsh, I know. I'm harsh at the organization. I have to say, part of the reason why I became an educator is because I would much rather invest my energy in helping individuals learn and develop. I'm somewhat skeptical on large organizations and wide scale change. So, you know, if you've got 15 minutes to either go do some ethnographic research or to make a pitch for how to change corporate culture, I'm always on the side of do the ethnographic research. It's a bias <laughs> that I acknowledge. <laughs> I'm also on the ethnographic research. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very much for this. Um, lots of insights you shared. Um, I guess there would be a lot of questions still open. Uh, sometimes we send the questions to our authors. If you would like, if you would agree on, we would uh, share some. And if you just feel comfortable with this. Um, and find I, would, I would love to, because I mean, this is a book that we wrote not to impress other academics, but to be helpful to real people in real organizations like you. So in some ways, um, questions, feedback on, again, when Garrett told me what he found particularly useful in the book, that's super helpful. The holes where we haven't helped and we need to, super helpful information. So would love to, you know, hear any, any input, data, questions, whatever would be terrific. Wonderful, so we collect them, maybe during today and tomorrow or so, and we send them. Wonderful. Wonderful. So then, thank you well, very much. Thank you. I hope that you have found this hour to be productive, and I look forward to more opportunities to talk. Wonderful. Thanks, Jan, and thank thanks you. also to all the listeners. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.